Testing. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we're about to start. If everyone could just turn um, off their cell phones. You can take pictures, but just no ringer. Okay. So I'd like to bring on stage Mira Blaustein. She's the co-founder of the Woodstock Film Festival, and she's going to be introducing the next panel. So come on up. Thank you, Hope. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks. I mean, I'm so glad that you walked in from the rain because you're in here for a treat. Um, this is the last day of the Woodstock Film Festival, and um, I hope that you have had a chance to take advantage of some of the wonderful films that we brought here and the great panelists and panels that we have put together for you. The panels at the festival are truly my favorite part. Um, we, uh, we, I'm so, we're so fortunate to be able to bring together here incredible directors, screenwriters, producers, and um, s all types of people from the film and television and media industries so accomplished and they come here and they interact with us and they interact with you and it's really a very rare opportunity to learn from them, be inspired by them and also be entertained. So um, the panel that you're about to hear here today, there are two wonderful screenwriters, one of whom has been with us, if I'm not mistaken, since year 2000. <laughs> Ron Knight, what? The beginning, the very, very beginning. Uh, he has been on the advisory board of the Woodstock Film Festival since the very beginning. Ron Nice winner. <laughs> Many of you know him. He, he wrote little films like Philadelphia <laughs> and little show, I mean, little shows like Homeland and Ray Donovan. Um, Ron is an incredibly accomplished screenwriter and one of the things I admire about Ron, and I admire a lot of things, is how the way he helps young people rise in their fields, and he's been doing that a lot with teenagers and with, yo and with uh, young talents. And the person that he's gonna be talking with here began as his assistant, and now she's collaborating with him on, uh, on uh, a show. So it's really very inspiring, I think. Also the way Ron works and, the, and how supportive he is. And he's very supportive of the film festival as well. So I'd love to bring Ron Nicewanner and Anya Lita up here. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to put your cell phones on silence, please. please. <laughs> I'll be like Patty Lapone. I'll just grab it from you <laughs> and take it backstage. Um, does that sound good, Jeff? Sound good. Jeff? Can you hear oh. me? Okay. Great. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, Ron Nice Swanner, in case you haven't guessed, Anya. <laughs> Anya Lita. Um, and thank you, Mayor. It's a privilege to be here, and it's an honor. And um, you know, I just that that beautiful introduction. Uh, you, there's uh, perhaps working with people like Anya is a sign of generosity, or perhaps it's uh, a sign of a need, uh, because <laughs> um, I, I need her energy and her talent. I need what she knows about the world today, uh, and I, you know, from her, Anya and I are exactly 30 years apart, apart. yeah we just uh, discovered and this and so you know um <laughs> and 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 so anya and, and to watch and one of the things that we'll talk about is anya's entrance into the business and speaking of um are, are there i i imagine there are a lot of fans of television here that's probably why you're here right people like to watch television Probably Hopefully, mostly yeah. <laughs> premium cable, I would imagine. Yes? Anybody out there? You're a quiet audience, I have to say. Wake up. Um, and um, are, are, there any, are there people who aspire or are working in television? Okay, Quite terrific. a few. Oh, actually. All my students, actually, from the oh. David Lynch screenwriting program are sitting in the front. So. Did she make you pay to get in? <laughs> um, 
Well, great. So Anya's entrance story into the business, I think, is much more relevant than mine, which happened <laughs> like 38 years ago, uh, and would not be able to be repeated. So we could, and so should I say what we're doing now? Yeah, and then, absolutely. Then let, you, sure. then let you talk for a minute. <laughs> this is sort of like what we were in the room. I'm like, especially on Claritin and coffee. I'm like, Rrr. Yeah. <laughs> Anya and my assistant Jack will say, like, they go, it's a coffee run, and they'll say, you know, Ron, you don't need coffee. No, not at all. But do you want to tell them what we're doing? Yeah, so we um, sold a show to FX earlier this year. Um, it's a, thank you, it's a political thriller called The Believers. And um, it was a really fascinating process developing a show um, with Ron. And we had worked on Homeland together in season seven. We co-wrote two episodes. They called us Ranya. It's our name <laughs> <laughs> together. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I think what we is, is Kathy here, by the way. So Hi, Kathy, Kathy was in our episode six. Yeah. She was in season seven of Homeland. Played, played Sandy. Sandy. Great She's in several more episodes. Yeah. Um, and so I think what something we'd like to talk about is kind of the process of making a show and selling a show. But I, I think a lot of conversations about selling a show are kind of superficial. Like I've been to some and they're like, you should spend five minutes talking about the characters and 10 minutes talking about the plot. And it's like, how, there's no formula really for selling a show. Um, and ideas are cheap, everybody has them. You know, my mother has many shows that she wants to sell and e like I completely Everyone at my that. gym, everyone at my gym is writing a pilot. Everybody. Everyone is writing. There was a, uh, my trainer, everybody. And people always ask like, how do you sell a show? And I have this great idea. And I think something we talk about a lot and we kind of gripe about is that an idea is not a show. <laughs> you know, we can't, we didn't sell a show about FBI agents. It's a very specific story. And what we sold was a show that an executive could say, oh, at least they see a season one that's very complete. And beyond that, they see how it would go on for five or six, hopefully seven years. years. Yeah, and so yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I get very resistant to when people say I have a great idea for a television show or a movie because you know I, the truth is an idea is meaningless. It's meaningless in the marketplace. Do you really think that people on Netflix, the executives, don't have ideas? I mean, they're not looking like, gee, I wish what could, what we can make a show about. Hmm, I wish somebody would walk in with an idea. <laughs> it's not what it's like at all. It, there, it's a, it's this long process. That's very detailed. And I just also want to say, just before we move on from you know, your entrance story, because I do think it's really cool, you know, and how you did, you know, from, I think this actually, to, to where you, from NYU to. From NYU. And by the way, she's a little modest, because we sold a show to FX so that we're co-creating. She's also on a show now as a staff writer on uh, Mosquito Coast with the great Neil Cross is running, the guy who created Luther. Show for Apple. So she's got so. two shows going, so like, you know. Yeah, but you have so, like so eight up shows. Next year, I'm like be asking for her for a job, but uh, no. But you have like eight shows yeah, that's going. True. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but I think your entrance story is really <coughs> helpful. You know, I think especially for the people which they all know. But <laughs> um, so yeah, I went to NYU grad school in Singapore. So I was focused on sort of more Asian and uh, world filmmaking as part of that program. And when I was, I studied uh, to be a director and I wanted to write and direct indie films. But I was very inspired by shows such as Six Feet Under, it was really life-changing for me, and The Wire, and I, I wanted to write them, but at that time, there wasn't that much TV writing in film schools, actually. Now there's, it's changing a lot. Um, so I went to, I moved to India after living in Singapore, and I tried to work in the Indian film industry. <laughs> Failed miserably at that. It didn't work out so well. Um, but I did manage to make a short film um, about this American couple that's going through surrogacy. So they hire a surrogate in India. And which, which played at the Woodstock Film In 2014. Festival. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I moved back to L.A. Um, in 2013. And I, I just said to myself, you know, I, I really want to write television. I don't know how. 
but every door that says TV writing, I'm just gonna open it. Like, I don't care. Like, TV something, I'm just gonna do it. And oddly, I mean, and very luckily, one of the jobs was working for Ron. Um, so that's how that whole thing started. Um, and as an assistant, I mean, and as an I, assistant, you know, and, it had, and I think, and I, I've I worked say, as an assistant yeah. a lot uh, on shows. I've bought a lot of coffee. I make a great cappuccino, <laughs> and I have all those skills. <laughs> and I think I did it with um, a, a sense of humor about it a little bit, which I think uh, it's important to be humble and have a sense of humor about it because uh, for me, it's all about developing relationships and you, you all know the industry is all about relationships that you have, so that's why I did those jobs. And you did them very competently. And also then I made a documentary that also played at the film festival, She's the Best Thing in It, and Anya came on as my assistant and then ended up being associate producer because she was doing so much. And I have to say there's an unwritten rule, which, and by the way, the rule applies today. Uh, don't ask me to read screenplays or pilots. Uh, and, that's, and that's the unwritten rule for any assistant who gets a job. The, the, the way to get fired is to turn to your boss and say, oh, will you read my pilot? No, you're fired. So that's uh, actually- That's an unwritten rule. Yeah. But, but I got to know Anya, and then eventually, eventually, I, then I was working on Homeland, and then I brought on, I, there was an assistant position, like an official full-time position for assistant, and Anya came in, and she was still fetching coffee, and, but I had read her, her, I'd just gotten to know her and like her and respect her so much, I actually said, let me read your script. And for all of you out there, what really impressed me is that somebody did not write a, a it was it was a start it was a student film right you wrote it for mm -hmm. but it wasn't about like oh you know my boyfriend broke up with me last night and I'm gonna have some friends over we're gonna talk about relationships you know I, I you know it what it, it was somebody who went out into the world and found something really fascinating to write about about the world and there was a point of view in it that was actually a very generous open point of view so that you could watch the film yourself and not be told what to think about surrogacy. And it was a very compelling film, and what a compelling adventure for a young woman to make this film in India. So already Anya goes bing, 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 way up on the scale of people that I'm interested in and working in in ways other than uh, fetching coffee? me coffee. And so <laughs> two years uh, on Homeland, uh, Anya's, and one day she walks into the room with my boss, the great Alex Ganza, who with Howard Gordon created Homeland, and uh, Alex and I were discussing something, and Anya delivered something. And walked out. It was of the dinner. Room. <laughs> Thai. I think it was, it was very Thai important. Food. It was an important moment. So. And I, Ali Scanset, and the other thing you don't do is say, I like, I don't say to Alex Scanset, oh, you know, you should read my assistant's script. You're fired. Uh, I'm fired. Yeah. Uh, so, but Ali Scanset says to me, you know, I have a feeling that Anya is working way below her capabilities. Door open. And I said, Alex, you have no idea. I said, you should read her incredible feature script based on her really incredible short film. So a few months later, she was hired for season seven of Homeland. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how it works. It was, you know, and, and by the way, if, if she had like delivered dinner with an attitude, Ali Scanza wouldn't have asked me that question. No. So that's, you know, it, it's, it was a, it's a tribute to you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and then, so since then, you know, when I wanted to, so the show, uh, The Believers, that we have sold to FX, I, I just felt, I, I'm developing, um, what I'm doing is I'm developing a, for a, a studio called Fremantle Media, and you've, they, they created a little show you've heard of called American Idol, <laughs> and which is basically just buckets of money just fall from the sky. Uh, every day, and so they have, like everybody else in the world, Apple, Facebook, etc., are venturing into scripted, dramatic television. And, uh, uh, and that's very lucky for me, because I know the guy who's the president, of, uh, the president of the studio, and about a year and a half ago, he, he asked me to leave Homeland, sadly, and uh, I was sad to leave it, but he, to, to come to Fremantle and to create, then be paid a salary, to create as much t and sell as much television as I can. So some of it I write, and some of it I co-write, and some of it other people write, and I, I, I mentor and guide them. Um, so, uh, so Anya, when I was, this thing, this story came along, there's something about it, uh, it got into my head, uh, I'm not even sure why. Actually, I do know why. Somebody pitched me a bad version of an informant show, really bad. And I said, I can do way better than that. 
And so I went away and I started thinking about it and it came to my mind that there would be uh, two women at the center of it. There would be a uh, 40-ish uh, FBI uh, agent and her 19-ish or 20-ish year old very complicated, uh, uh, a young woman informant, and they would both be very complicated women who are in there doing their jobs for all sorts of reasons, and they would have a very uh, complicated, we hope compelling, relationship. And I felt, you know, I, from, I just, I need a colleague in that, and uh, a young woman colleague would be great, and like, so, there you go. <laughs> and so, I asked Anya very early to come on, and you know, it's been a year at least now, yeah, we, it, we developed it for like eight or nine months before we actually pitched it. We started really? in August. No, it was six of, months, wasn't it? Please don't tell me. It was, it was eight months, really? Uh, anyway, time just keeps flying by, seven. as you all know. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah it, was, it was quite a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time. Yeah, and, um, and it, was a, it was about a six-week or two-month pitching process to about 13 buyers, I think. Right? Yeah, that was the most terrifying experience of my life <laughs> was those so, pitches. That was... Very scary. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But you know, I think really, again, as Anya was saying, people focus so much on how you sell a show. You know, you gotta have something to sell. That's, what, that's how you sell a show. So it was the creation of that show that actually I think is more relevant than like how we pitched it. And so we've been talking for the last couple of days is that, you know, what makes a show sellable? What, and you know, and I'm actually gonna refer to notes because I can't remember anything anymore. Um, so, we, we've talked about how a compelling idea, I mean, a, a, an an idea uh, is, is not all you need, but it's certainly a compelling idea is essential. And so, and you know, we, people, we talk about this all the time, what makes a compelling idea? So I'm gonna give you an example of one. Uh, Walter White is a chemistry teacher. <laughs> Has no power. Oh my God, daughter's right here, and Benny. Hi, I just looked and saw hi. <laughs> Oh, there's my row behind your row. <laughs> and there's my row over there. You're all my row. Uh, uh, did I embarrass you just now? Oh, okay. Um, we're celebrating our mutual birthdays uh, together. Um, so, thank you. So Walter White is a chemistry teacher, has no power in his life at all. Kids barely listen to him. He's dying of lung cancer. He has a handicapped child. He has no idea how he's going to, what they're going to do after he dies. How's, how are they going to live? And lo and behold, what happens? He goes with his brother-in-law on a raid of a meth dealer's house and finds out how much money does somebody make for cooking crystal meth? A lot. And he's a chemistry Good. teacher. Yeah. And then uh, becomes one of the greatest shows in television history, Breaking Bad. And that, is a com that idea, you, you see immediately all of the, so much conflict in that idea. And it's not just conflict with the outside world. I mean, although his brother-in-law <laughs> is a DEA agent, uh, it's conflict within himself, because he's a decent guy who then gets sucked to, and as Vincent Gilligan said, you know, that show is ultimately about the power of evil. And that if, you know, that if you think that you can play with evil, you can get what you need out of it, and it won't, and, and it won't affect you, but over the, course of several seasons, we see Walter becoming, and eventually his wife even joining it, becoming seduced by power. And that, and that show, and... Which, I mean, that just really makes me wonder, and I, I've read things about it, of course, but, you know, in television we always talk about how characters don't change, in a way. And in movies, you know, a movie is about a character changing, and in TV I think it's actually the opposite. You kind of look for continuity of a character, at, you know, week after week, and, you know, did Don Draper ever change? Like, he was always a philandering asshole. That was who he was. <laughs> for five years, um, and I think, I love him, he's a charming, <laughs> very charming one. Um, but with, with Walter White, it, the question is really, like, did he really change, did he become evil, or was he always evil all along? And that ego gratification that he needed, it was more just a realization, I think, of who he was, who he is as a person, and that's why the show is so yeah. brilliant. And so. Anya said something, um, you said something recently to me about that the pilot, what often sets up 
asks a question that the show then spends the next six or seven years attempting to answer. And that's actually called a premise pilot, where the, the pilot establishes a premise of the show. Um, and you know, but so we think about The Sopranos, which really is the beginning of what we call the second golden age of television. You know, uh, The Sopranos is when people who actually thought they were smart, smarter than television, started saying, oh my god, like actually there's a great show on television. And that was the beginning. And you think about Tony Soprano, mafia chieftain, you know, going to a therapist because he's disturbed about it, what he's doing. And then for, was it seven years? You know, you have this question, you know, does Tony have a conscience that he's actually wrestling with? Does he have an inner life? And then they chose to answer it that no. Actually, he's actually a sociopath. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you toy with that question. You give him flashes of humanity now and then. You know, um, we did I, that on Homeland. I mean, Carrie Matheson is a classic character as well. Like the, the central question of that character is really, can you be a CIA officer and a normal person? And in her case, absolutely not. So we get eight years of drama from that. And I think that's really important in thinking about your show and your idea is what is that central conflict of the character that is unsolvable? Like can Walter White ever be a, a chemistry teacher and a meth dealer? No, like they don't work together. So the joy of watching a television show is watching him struggle through that. If he could handle both worlds really well, there would be nothing to watch. So that's kind of what we try to do when we think about yeah. character. And the main character is like, what is that unsolvable, impossible issue that, that just will never work out for them? And, you know, and be, because uh, knowing the creators of Homeland so well and knowing that uh, it was an interesting thing that, that Carrie Matheson was not bipolar uh, in the first draft of the pilot. And, and Showtime, and often there's this total myth that's told about like this battle between us very sensitive, deep artists, and those crass, horrible executives. Throw the, take that idea and throw it away, folks. Yeah. Uh, you're, you, you go into HBO or Showtime or Amazon or Netflix, man, you are sitting across the table, FX, from some really smart people who really know stuff about the world, they know literature, it, it's that whole stereotype of executives that really needs to be thrown out. And the executives of Showtime that I, I, I actually know really well, they said Carrie, it was, she was a very righteous young woman trying to chase down this, uh, what she thought was a terrorist. And they said, that's not enough, guys. It's not enough. And so, and then somebody on the show had, I don't want to say her name because it might give something personal away, but somebody on the show had a sibling who was bipolar. And then that, they said, oh, well, and then think about what's amazing about that. You know, uh, if you know the show Homeland, if you know the first season, first three seasons are all about, well, the first season is all about is Brody a terrorist or not? Even as she seduces him and sleeps in, is he or not? She says he is. And everyone's saying, Carrie, you're kind of crazy. Yeah. And so now you give that, so that, that thing, you give it to a bipolar person. But also the, theme, the show's deeper themes. And if you watch it over several years, more themes are explored. You know, which is that because Brody turned out to be a, a Muslim, you know, the, the season, episode three when he takes out the uh, prayer rug and prays, but you know, you really understood what, what, why he had become who he had become. You know, that he, he saw the uh, ugly side of American power in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So Homeland tried really hard, some people feel not successfully all the time, but to really sort of address it wasn't the CIA officer is not always the hero. As a matter of fact, in season four, the, f at the first opening episode is the drone queen because Carrie accidentally drones a wedding and kills 23 people. And then she leaves the CIA at the end of that season. So they, they always went to that place of division in a character. And that, that brings me, should we talk a little bit about character? Yeah, yeah sure. Which is something, you know, I, uh, and I, I, my, my god darn her friend Benny are, are, are great actors and it, this is to me ha, this comes has a lot to do with acting as well but I you know we struggle with character and um, I learned something just recently do we all know who Lee Child is Lee Child wrote the, had the, the great Jack Reacher novels and uh, Lee Child if you get the 20th anniversary of the first Jack Reacher novel Lee Child writes an essay in front of it and I suggest all writers uh, read that, and Lee Child tells you what a character is. A character is not a list of characteristics. 
So a lot of times you, I work with people and they're like, well, they, they love pizza and like, they're like really into their video games and like their mother was like in the military and blah, 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 and they got spanked too much and blah. That's not a character. That's a list of characteristics. A character is something essential. And Lee Child says that his character, Jack Reacher, and although he's played by Tom Cruise in the movies, in the novels, one of his essential traits is he's large. <laughs> He's a big guy. He's a big, muscular guy. And when he walks into a room, and you know, there are people, that something happens. And the other thing is that he was a military child, so he moved constantly. He never has a home. That's all you have to know about Jack Reacher. He's a big guy. Oh, and he has a soft spot for the underdog. That's all you need to know. That's all Lee Child says. That's all I know about him. Hmm. I can't really tell you much else about him. Hmm. You know, and, and he's written 20 pretty, if you read, they're pretty great novels, actually. So that's what's something we always try to get to. You know, and then developing the show, The Believers, you know, who are these two characters, Louise and Charlotte are our main characters, mm. who are they essentially? Mm -hmm. You know, and then all that other stuff, you know, fills in, but everything, and what is the show essentially? Yeah. And FX actually pointed us, we, did, we handed in a draft, which we were very, very proud of, uh, a, a couple of months ago, and we got a surprising, you, it's not like a negative note, like people don't call you up and say, we hate it. Uh, but they had an idea that turned it a little, well, didn't really turn it on its head, but it, it went deeper into it. Yeah, right? I mean, it was basic, I mean, the note was basically to make it more character driven, which I was a little confused by because we sold a thriller, so there's action in it, and you want the characters, especially with the female characters, I want them to be in physical jeopardy and have exciting things to do. Um, they're actually, they're actually badasses. They're, really, yeah, and they're it's really, really cool, both great. of them. Great. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that the note was really good because then what we ended up doing is diving into more of the essential qualities, which I think you're talking about, of what a character really is. What was interesting is um, when we think about backstory, like I feel like writers think I at least think so much about backstory, like what happened before, and I've kind of learned to not think about that as much. It's more about adjusting the backstory according to the story that we want to tell. And so we changed this character and a lot of her essential qualities and her what had happened to her before based on what we ended up doing for the pilot. So yeah. that was kind of an interesting experience to just be like, oh, this, just throw that out the window. She's a totally different person now. Um, and, and they took us to the essential conflict of the show, which is yeah. that it's, uh, yeah, and Anya and I, we had gotten sort of, the reason the informant show was on my mind and our mind is because it, it's a big part of Homeland, and there was a season where we did like a ton of research on informants, uh, which are just fascinating. I mean, there are people, there's, there are professional informants who like, they like go to Pittsburgh and they infiltrate a Latin gang, and they're not even Latino or Lat Latinx, excuse me. Uh, or they, then they move to like Milwaukee and they infiltrate like a Muslim group and then they move, it's like they're professionals, they're professional chameleons, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. We, we, didn't, we weren't going professional for Professional liars. Professional, and, yeah. but, and they're put in the place of, of course I can't tell the people in their home lives what they're doing either and they can't tell the people that they're infiltrating and befriending. And there's something about what an informant has to do is seduce you. They have to make you think that they believe in your cause, that they are they bond with you as a member of the family. And we also found that people who they're called handlers, the FBI handlers, they have to seduce their informants. You know, a lot well, a lot of times there's a, informants are often recruited on the way to prison. So the first seduction is you could go to prison or you could help us. Yeah. You know, and then there's there's and there's a seduction to the cause, you know, and this is why we're doing this, you know. So and then in our show, the young woman who desperately needs a parent that she can trust, because the ones in her life are not particularly, they're very colorful, but not particularly <laughs> emotionally <Kind>. reassuring. <laughs> yeah. um, and our FBI agent, uh, let's say, has mother issues or child issues. Uh, there are, there's, there's a dark history uh, that involves violence and her, perhaps the biggest, certainly the biggest mistake that she made in her life, which is, uh, left her bereft and quite and with tragic consequences involving her children. So now we've got, hmm, what's going to happen? And so they have, and, and our informant, without, I, we can't tell too many details because FX would not appreciate that, but she infiltrates a group and we wanted to, to, to our group, I don't, we wanted it to be something that actually 
you as the viewers will be sympathetic toward their purpose. Yeah. Can we say what it is? Kind of? I guess so, yeah. 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 It's yeah. an eco-terrorist cell. So they're extremist environmentalists, and uh, the leader of this cell that she infiltrates, it kind of makes a good love triangle, right? Because you have the FBI informant on one side kind of vying for this informant's love, and then... And loyalty. Have, and okay. loyalty. To the cause. And then you to have the, the same law. thing happening on the other side with the eco-terrorist leader, so it's kind of a child caught between two parents. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good da yeah. The dad mom. Yeah. Yeah. So that and that that t we sort of jumped ahead. Do we do we want to go through? Since we're there, should we do the? I, we'll get back to the other things we're going to do because we're totally out of order. But do we? <laughs> Always. <laughs> do we want to do the? Um, the slideshow. What do you call yeah. that thing now? I mean, this happens all day. I like lose right point to things, and Anya finishes my sentences. Um, uh, so this is so just so we again we're going to kind of go through it. We're just going to go through it because we don't want to tell you too much about the show. Uh, we've told, and we're not, we shouldn't tell you more than we've already told you. But, but in preparation for our pitch, we went in with are there fifty over fifty slides. Fifty, yeah. Yeah, exactly. so so we had us. There were three of us, Anya and another colleague, Jack. Uh, the three of us doing the pitch. The pitch was scripted. Uh, memorized and scripted. Word and then, by word. And then, but then, because yeah. I am totally crazy and obsessive, uh, I, we, I just totally rewrote the, the what we're doing right now back there. Like, I said, Anya, Anya, I don't want to do that in that order. Um, she's used to it. Yeah. Uh, so, like when you change the pitch before Hulu, you change the order completely, like 10 minutes before, and I was just like, I did. What? Did it work? I don't know. Yeah, we didn't sell to Hulu, sell so maybe it. not. <laughs> Fuck that up. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I probably had like an extra espresso that morning. Yeah, it was a yeah, lot. Yeah, like, oh, let's change you, the pitch. It's you, not good enough. You were a lot, yeah. yeah. So I go through life sometimes. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, you You're liked like, it I'm yesterday, so Ron. This. <laughs> I'm like, because you've heard it 50,000 times. Of yeah, I'm bored. bored by it. Yeah. Uh, the pitch did get better. Come on. It, no, it did. It, it did we, get we better. Did. Yeah. yeah. It got it better as it went along. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, Oh, now, see, I forgot what this happens every day, too. What? What? Slides. Uh, slides. So, Thank you. So the slides are going on with oh, the pitch. Right. There are, three, there are three of us. There's yes. Jack, Anya, myself, and we have a, a semi-scripted, although we rehearsed it so often and frequently that it, we didn't want it to sound scripted. So, it was you know, like it'd being be an like, actor. Like, it was horrible I'd sometimes go like, say, like, oh, that reminds me. <laughs> like... What oh, you, I would do that all the time, too. spent six months writing that line. I'd be like, like, it just occurred to me. Yeah, you know, I think and we should add. it was, like, written. <laughs> it was, I, I, I scripted my part word for word, because yeah. I just needed it. And I memorized it like I was an actor, and then I pretended to be spontaneous, because I just felt like I couldn't, it was a I'm totally, just not one of those it's pitch people, is a total you know. performance. Yeah. But, and what, this one had to be scripted, because we really, it was coordinated with these slides, which <laughs> the script was cued. So our colleague Jack, whose job was mostly to do the slides, um, when I said to blah, 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 and then you know, she blows up the car. Boom, the, the blown up car would show up. So actually there's no blown up car, I just made that up. Uh, but that, so it had to be, so we were doing a, a pretty sort of well rehearsed presentation. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, so, um the, you know, I just got to say about slides and visuals, not everyone does them for pitches, but I love them because I love when they're, they're not just looking at you the entire time, which you can just get crazy. It's so nice to just point to something else and also give them an idea of the tone of the show, which I think the visuals do without yeah. explaining too much. Uh, this is the article that uh, the show is based on. So we had that. Can I just say one thing about that? Actually, we the idea for the show came before I knew that article existed. But I <clears throat> I went to my management company, Anonymous Content, and they have a great uh, intellectual property person there. And I said, you know, I need like a great piece of intellectual property because there's something that just adds to the pitch. Like, well, I didn't just make this up, guys. Although we did. Uh, it's like, see, yeah. there's this article, and they go like, oh, there's an article. Uh, it must be important. And also. But I loved that title, uh, The Believers, and I thought, you know, I, let's buy the article so basically we can have the title. So that was... Yeah. I mean, and the only thing we took from the article is the title and the fact that there's an FBI agent, an informant, and an eco-terrorist. Yeah. And beyond that, it, there, it's no relation at all to the article. 
So, um, you know, just also giving them a sense in the pitch of how relevant, you know, because it's dealing with environmental issues, which if you live in the world, you know, are a big deal right now. And the question in every pitch is, why are you telling this show today? Why, why, should, yeah. we, why should we make this show today? Yeah. Um, we gave a rundown of our main characters, just kind of giving a sense. Um, this is the eco-terrorist cell, so the kind of people that are part of it. Um, and we worked really hard, to, I think we should just, but we worked really hard on, I think we keep going, we, um, that the, the images all have, we hope, a very consistent t tone. They tend to be more blue. We really went that, we were that obsessive about it, that actually we tried to be like with good cinematography uh, mm -hmm. about it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we also wanted to suggest people of different ethnic, ethnicities uh, for, for the same roles, so that people would know that our, it's castable, it doesn't have to, it's not, we're not just presenting you know, one sort of uh, ethnic group uh, for the roles. So this was, yeah, so this is going on and as we're pitching going on. It's, uh, it's pretty cool now that I look at it. <laughs> um, yeah, this was kind of putting the characters together to get a sense of kind of grouping our main characters together as families, because the show is a lot about families, within the cell, within real families, sort of your, the family you choose and the family you have. <laughs> and then when we wanted them to know that we have a whole show, by the way, we don't have just a, uh, an hour of television, because you know, the shows that we're pitching, most people are looking for 12 hours a season, and for a show to be monetized, it, has to, it really sh has to be on the air for five years. For, for a studio, because let's just think about what, I mean, show average premium cable shows, I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, which is, you know, $18 million an episode, but the average cable shows can be five or $6 million an episode or more. So in a 12 <coughs> season, epi uh, 12 episode season, you're talking about 70 or $80 million of expense. So they, the I, how are we gonna pay for that and how are we ever gonna make a profit is a very actually relevant question for a studio to ask or a network yeah. to ask. So one of the things they wanna know is like, yeah, this is a great idea, but can we get at least a really complete season of television and that gives them confidence that there are mm. five years. So we went through, so basically we broke our season into three acts and we did this thing where we have the plot and the emotional arcs. And again, you know, the pitch to me is really a reflection. This isn't a, a, a a panel about selling or marketing. This is a panel about writing and creating. Because I, I was taught a long time ago, and I do it on a lot of things on my movie scripts, I do, I, I, plot is really important. But I'll tell you who told me, there's, there's plot and story. And do everybody, well, of a certain age, you know who the great actor Peter Falk yeah. is, yeah, Columbo? Yeah. Peter Falk wanted to be in a script I wrote 35 years ago. <laughs> Nice. And he took me out, and he told me, you know, Ron, Ron, he's got one eye. You know, like, Ron, uh, there's plot and there's story. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> you know, and like, plot's like the thing that like you need to know, kind of gets you from one point to the other, and story is why it matters. Like, mm -hmm. wow, okay. <laughs> That's good. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, plot gets you through, gets you from point A to point B, you know, uh, but the but what's going on in the characters? And that's what, why we really watch television, because we see them making decisions and we know, we, we get a sense from the decisions they make about what's going on in their inner lives. So when we, did our, when we did our season one, we went through, these are the plot arcs, this is you know, what's gonna happen, and then these are the character arcs. Now, when we start writing the show, we're, gonna, we're not gonna look at any of the, that stuff that's mm. up there. <laughs> You know, we'll have moved on from it. But it was important for us, I think, it'll still stay with us. And, so, and But that is how we write. I mean, we, we'll be in the room, and actually we're gonna get into the writer's room, I think, right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and you will get into the room, and a lot of what you talk about is plot, because yeah. a lot of what we do uh, in the writer's room is solving problems. So we've sold a show. In this particular case, we've been asked to write a pilot. Sometimes you go out with the pilot already written, and so they have a better sense of the show. They also might have more of a sense of what they want to reject, why they would want to reject it. So it's not that doesn't necessarily help you sell a show to have the pilot. Although sometimes I don't, I, I on some of the shows I'm trying to sell, we're going out with the pilot. 
uh, and some shows were going out just with a pitch. So this uh, one, we had no pilot at all. So it was all verbal, what we did. Um, and I think just going, it kind of, it relates to the pitching of it too. I think what executives look for, and it's in all great television shows, it's not just the lead character and their conflict, it's also kind of what I like to call the on-screen couple, and it doesn't have to be a romantic Thank couple, you. like Walter White and Jesse are the best on-screen couple. You always want them to be together, and when they break up, you're just waiting for them to get back together. Um, and I think, and we, with our two women leads, we also have that couple energy and that's kind of, and the conflict between those characters also forms the heart of the show. Mm -hmm. And and Carrie and Brody, and you know, there's millions of examples of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, we thought, and, and one of the experiences I had as a, having been many, for many years a feature writer, uh, living over there in West Hartley, uh, and, and, and having this community that I love so much, but I went out to LA uh, seven years ago I, I, I basically said, my manager said, what do you want? And I said, get me out of my house. Uh, because that whole like, oh, I'm a writer and I'm alone and That's the muse awful. speaks to me is like such total bullshit. <laughs> it's like total bullshit, it's not what writers do. The muse doesn't speak to me. If the muse is speaking to, to you, you're psychotic. You need to get li lithium. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know, uh, what we do is that we, we solve problems. And in the writer's room, what is amazing and wonderful is that you're in a room with five or six other people who are solving the same problem that day. Mm -hmm. And that problem might be, uh, you, you know, um, how does Carrie, how does Carrie uh, discover that the guy she's sleeping with, and this would be season seven, is actually... Russian, and I can't even, a Russian spy. A Russian I can't spy. even remember more than Yeah, I was like, which guy is she sleeping with? Which season? <laughs> there were so many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, well, um, yeah. But yeah. I have to Anyone Carrie sleeps with dies, of course, but, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's the other thing. That yeah. seems to be her yeah. fate. Yeah. But, but I have to say about being in the writer's room, it's, um, you know, because I, I come from a feature background, and that's what I wanted to do. I thought writing was about sitting in my room and maybe living in hotels and drinking a lot. I don't know. It was just this thing. Well, and. You could do that too, but it's so great it's that I don't have to do that. I don't have to be alone. And I feel like I, every day I go to work in a writer's room and just being on set with lovely people like Kathy on Homeland, it's, it's, um, I get to have buddies and I, I just can't say how I feel very lucky that I get to do that because it's so great when you have a problem. You, if you've ever written a script or a story, you know when you get stuck and you just cannot, you're just like, I can't, I can't figure it out. Well, in a writer's room, you get stuck and you have six other people who can be like, well, I can, you can do this. And so you have people solving each other's problems and you solve other people's problems. So it, that's just such a great process and a great kind of collaboration yeah. to have. Should we just sort of give them, we thought it'd be kind of fun, like we would tell you, when we wrote episode six of season seven together, just like what one of our days was like. Like, that's like what, what that is. Uh, and I love when people sort of say like, oh, like, what do you do? And I'm like, I work like, no, what else do you do? It's like, what else? <laughs> and you'll, you'll kind of like, you'll understand why. So let's say that the, we're, we're about to start our writing episode six out of a 12 season arc. We've been, we had written, co-written episode three. We've moved on to episode six. So I think first we should say, how did episode six become episode six? Uh, we broke it. It's called Breaking Story in the Room, and you have this, it, they're all different writer's rooms, but we, on this one we had a big white wall that's blank at the beginning of the season. <laughs> and you know that you're gonna have to fill that wall with cards, and every card will be a scene in that episode. So we had episodes one through 12. Did Actually, that's, we did have one through 12. We had the numbers. And everything else was blank. Um, and then you start, you know, we kind of spent maybe two weeks talking about major season arcs, what, what's Carrie up to this season. And, and in Homeland, that, was, that came after a, a week of being in Washington and doing spy deep, camp. deep research yeah. and, and uh, spy camp. And really talking, talking <laughs> to uh, 
people people that you know you 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 you've seen on Rachel Maddow, people you've seen on CNN. Matter of fact, we've had people. Remember, Clint said like, guys, I, I gotta go. I got I gotta be on Rachel like uh, like I be. <laughs> so they would come and talk to us. So we really got you know really into sort of involved with what people in the FBI and the CIA, in the press, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who report on Washington and what they what their lives were like and what they were worried about. And that's where we got our inspiration. And that life. was kind of the central question that we asked them was like what keeps you up at night, you know, and they would tell us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we kind of took that question, that question on Homeland always becomes the season. So season seven, it was all about Russian interference in the election and misinformation and all those fun <laughs> things that are still going on. Um, so yeah, we broke every episode, so that involves a just a shit ton of talking. It gets so tedious too. It sometimes is really fun and then other times you're like stuck as a group and, for a week. And what that talking is, is you, we use the word pitch when you go out to sell a show, you pitch, but also what you do all day in the writer's room is you pitch. And actually if you, if you don't, if you're not successful at pitching, you're not gonna last long in the television industry. Mm -hmm. And it is terrifying. And especially when you come on to a show like Homeland, which has some of the smartest people who know so much about television, but also know they go home and they read, like they go home and they read um, in the summer, like on the, their months off, they're like reading about politics. They they eat and breathe, mm. so they know so much about politics and history. And you step into that room, and they also the people on Homeland had had a long history because they had worked on other shows together. So they had some of them had had like a 15 year long history, and they would mm -hmm. speak like in like their own language. It was terrible. Like Anya and I would sit there, they'd be like, oh, you know what? Let's do like the bridge thing. You know, like, yeah, like, oh, yeah, the bridge thing, but we could do like the twist on the bridge thing. And I'm like, what is the bridge thing? Like, mm, like can someone that tell was me like what the bridge thing from, is? From 24 that they worked on together. It was crazy. It was all like yeah. shorthand to them. I actually had no idea what they were saying for at least two weeks. I have to say, I just, and I kept asking every day, I would go into Ron's office and be like, so what were they, the bridge thing? Like, yeah, no, like, just, I said, you, just fake you do it. develop a shorthand, and I think we have a shorthand on our own show yeah, too, where like nobody would yeah. know what we were talking about. But there was such a depth of research. So, we're, so the basic thing is that you're in this writer's room from say 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Six. Uh, that that was that's yeah that's not some shows are much longer much longer the comedies comedies for long. all night <laughs> and you are expected you know so you know that the you're you're working on uh, episode six and you know that you're stuck on this thing that's like where Carrie like comes to the realization oh my god this guy that I thought was feeding me really valid information from inside the FBI is actually planted by Russia to be feeding me disinformation and like how do you do all that so we're you know we're at, we're we're at that point and so what you do if you, you begin, you know, what's the beginning of the episode? And as scenes form, cards go up on the wall, and when you're in a scene where you're doing that, so you're pitching. So that means, like, you're starting the day and saying, and Alex Gans is such a great, uh, uh, these guys are so smart and so nice. It was like the whole Homeland experience, then you go to the set and it'd be like, it's a cult or something. Because they're, like, like, so nice. It's, yeah, like, it's, it's they, so good. It's so <laughs> loving and... Claire Danes is the best, and Mandy is amazing. So anyway, we were so lucky. And you spend all day, and you have to have the courage. And I, I have said to people, being on Homeland in the writer's room is a contact sport. And it's, a con it's like a contact sport, an intellectual yeah. contact sport. Cause, and you're sitting, literally, that room was, it was small. Ugh, it was yeah. so funky. Yeah, it was like, a, you'd think like, you have this hit couch. show, could you, you get like a new like couch? You think it's like glamorous, it's not. <laughs> like the air conditioner like was so loud. We no windows. Hear, like, it this is just... like Fox. Like Rupert Murdoch can't afford, like I kept saying like, we can't we get a new air conditioner? Like, eh, air don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> so you sit there all day and you, you, so what you do is like, and you have, so it's all research based. So I've been up at since six in the morning or staying up trying to like read Russia, 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 Russia. And all the news Inform, in disinformation, yeah. uh, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, all this, you know, like trying to get it in. And you come and say, and you have to have the courage and go for it. Like, okay, I, okay, so, uh, you know, so what <laughs> if, you know, he leaves his like, and then you often sort of say, okay, this is gonna be a bad pitch. <laughs> Set the expectation yeah, low so pitch. you can like, over deliver. Like, just like he has a, his wallet and she finds it and there's like something that's like a note in Russian, you know, there. And like <laughs> what you don't do, well, the room is a little tough, but the, the unwritten rules are that you don't say, oh, that, I, that's not good. That doesn't work. That, that's not, that, that's, you're, that's not, you're not going to last in a writer's room. You know, we don't care about your opinion. Nobody wants, uh, what showrunner wants your fucking opinion? Like there's Twitter. <laughs> 
there's reviews. Yeah, exactly. you, you're going to get all the opinions later, yeah. so, so it's you, not helpful. What you could do in a writer's room is you improve or replace. You improve or replace. So you go, okay, okay, okay. And, and the thing that's really exciting is that you have to be a little bit egoless. And even though you're saying, they're saying, that is the dumb, like a spy's gonna like leave his wallet sitting around. Like, really? You know, like with a Russian note in it. And you're like saying to yourself, like, and this is just an example, I just made this up, it's just an example. Nobody in that room was dumb enough to ever suggest <laughs> anything like that, except maybe I did. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you know, but you have to have, you go with it. You say, okay. Okay, so like, what if it's what if it's actually like a key card, it's something to a you know, it's actually his computer password, you know, and then like yeah, and then then you go with it, and then Carrie sort of sneaks it out, and she likes curious, and she goes, and he's in the shower, and she goes, and she gets on his computer, and you know, and and you go with that as far as it goes, mm. and then at a certain point, and then the person who can shift the conversation is the showrunner, who then will say, eh, guys, can we approach it from a different point of view? Yeah. You know, can we like, what about, what if, let's forget the wallet for a minute, for a minute. And you, you know, they try to do that without dismissing, but sometimes, again, because, the, and they were very loving people, but they were tough. They had worked, they didn't have patience to like coddle you because you're new. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so they'd be like, that's not going to work around. Yeah. No, no, no. And that's you know, over. You know, no, no, no. And then what you can't do is freeze. It's such a great lesson in just how to yeah. really be in life. Because if you sit there saying like, Wow, he doesn't like my idea. Wow, oh man, it's and then such you're not a helping, idea. and you know, yeah. you're like lost. You're like sulky self pity. Yeah, you know, you're not gonna last. Yeah. So I, I've often said you got to be able to pitch twenty ideas yeah. and have all twenty rejected, and then you got to come up twenty with twenty one. That's all. That's yeah. your job, and it's gonna hurt, man. I had there a couple of days when I went back to the office thinking, am I really that stupid, or like, am I, you know. It was, it was, it definitely challenged your hmm. ego. And then eventually the group mind, which is a fascinating, is, I, is someone, I think somebody should study this, the group mind, when there are five or six people, has this, uh, this thing happens where we go in a certain way. Now we did have experiences where I remember that we get to the end of a day of eight hours. And then really, like in the final half hour, Something like happens. somebody, <laughs> somebody would just pull the thread and everybody would go, oh my God, we, it's terrible. We just, and you know, I remember Chip once, Johansson once said, like, this is really a bunch of shit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think actually he meant like what we worked on for a week. Yeah. And when you have had that experience where like a whole, you see a whole week's work just going. Just over. But what happens is the adrenaline of once you get into production, well, even before you're in production, you can't, and this is one of the things that's also great about it. If you're at home and you're doing your thing, like, oh, one year goes by, two years go by, it's still not good enough. Oh, the muse isn't speaking to me today. <laughs> you know, uh, guess what? In television, they're shooting your episode in 10 days. <laughs> Get over it. Solve yeah. the problem. It's a wallet. He's got a Russian note from his mother. Whatever. Write it. Sucks. It sucks. Shoot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, right. Although I have to say, rarely in Homeland did anything suck. No, I mean, you know, it was, it, it was yeah, very we, well we never, I, we never really went to that. We went to like, it's not great, but let's make it work. But I think what, and this is uh, talking so much about the showrunner who's so great, is that he had the ability to see when things really didn't work. And I do remember we developed this entire plot for the first half for two or three weeks that we were struggling with those names on the wall, and they, it was people were quitting their jobs, and it was this whole thing. And finally, three weeks later, he walks in and he says, it, it just doesn't work, like come up with something else. And, and it's I'm a horrifying like, moment, because that's three weeks closer you are yeah. to having to have a script ready. And we had to rebuild the entire thing, and what it's we horrifying. ended up rebuilding was way better. And I can't imagine yeah. doing the other version, so. Yeah, yeah. It, but it may, it, and then what happens is that once your episode is being cast, so you are staying in the writer's room to write, you know, to, because while you're writing, you're, if you get assigned an episode, you're writing the outline, you come in, you present the outline, it gets sh shit upon by everybody. <laughs> yeah, by In a kind people. way, sort of. And yeah. then you go back and you come back three times and then it's, it's acceptable and then same thing with the episode. And it's about an hour, so why are you, yeah. Okay, and um, I'll wrap this up. And uh, we're gonna go to questions. And uh, you, 
while you know, you're doing that, you're staying in the room to talk about seven episodes to help your colleagues with episodes seven and eight. Then script, the script for five has come in. So now you gotta read, you're writing episode six, you're staying in the room all day from 10 to, so you're writing before 10 a.m., after 6 p.m., or at lunch. You're staying in the room, you're helping break seven and eight, you're reading script five, which is about to start shooting, you're starting to cast your episode, so for a two-line part... You're watching part, like hundreds of videos. Two-line part can yeah, get 30, 30 one-line parts get 30 tapes that come in. That, you know, so you're doing that, at lunch to end writing, and 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 then maybe episode three is in the editing room that you wrote, and then you have to run down the editing room, and you have to sit with the editor and watch that. So when people say, "What are you doing this week?" like uh, uh, when I'm not working, like sleeping for six hours, maybe if I'm lucky. That you know, that's that's and it's actually thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it is. Is it? So we have time. We uh, have time for questions, and Hope is going to bring you a microphone. So, um, if you want to ask a question, the first hand went up. Meanwhile, thank you. Seriously, thank you. Thank you. Um, what happens if you've done the homework and you have something you're ready to present, and then it's who's your showrunner? It what? And then the question comes back to who's your showrunner? So how important is the showrunner to getting you in the door? Oh. You mean for, to get a job? You mean you're trying to sell no, a no, television I'm so show? Sorry. I'm so no, sorry. Let me back up on myself. I'm sorry. Uh, you've, you've created a, you're ready to do a pitch. You've created a pitch, basically. And um, uh, you, keep, you, you hear back, well, who is your showrunner? So the question really is how important is the showrunner to you to get through that door to do a pitch if you don't have all the connections and you're just trying to break in. It's essential. Yeah. That's all. I, because, the, the, you know, can you now, say just but, but, but uh, and we'll just, just, we'll just go with that for a little bit. It, but you, what can happen is that people, if people love the script or love the presentation, whatever it is, and it, they, they might assign somebody um, a showrunner. They might say, they might say, you know, Ron's. I hear, you know, Ron's actually available, and you know, like, let's see if he's interested in, or in this sort of thing. I have to say, in terms of selling, you know, what people, it's really hard. It's breaking into that is a really, really difficult thing because people need a lot of assurances that if they're going to start spending money, that they're going to get a return on their Seventy million dollars. Yeah. yeah. So it's the more that you walk in the door with. I say to people, if you're starting out, you know, if you. Uh, and you know, it, it's to start from like zero, which is like I've never worked in television before. I, you know, that's really hard. That's really, really hard. It can be done. It's really hard. Anya did it. Took five years of fetching coffee and being in the world of television. <laughs> to be outside the world, that's really hard. So uh, people can love a script. I've had jobs, gotten jobs from scripts that were never made. Because people said, God, I love that script. And you say, why don't you make it? Like, I don't want to make it. I want to do something else with you. Hmm. So, so scripts have value. Pilot scripts, movie scripts have value beyond uh, getting made. They have value that, that they do sometimes get people in the door to do other things. Yeah. Like, I have a pilot that I wrote that I'd love to make as a show, but it's, it's never been made. But it, I continuously get jobs on other shows staffing from that script. And I will say with our show, The Believers, like we are co-creators of the show, but Ron is a showrunner. So if the show actually gets made, they're going to let the more experienced person run the show. So if you don't have- <laughs> You all are my witnesses. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, Anya, we're gonna be in the room, I'm gonna say, Anya, I remember the Woodstock Film Festival. <laughs> you said, so anyway, I, let's, uh, yeah. let's take another question. Well, the people in the back might need oh, to hear you. I don't want to. I'll start singing. <laughs> it's not you, karaoke. <laughs> how do you keep it being derivative? We just saw a new show that was on Netflix. It just came out with uh, Jessica Lange. One of the story plot lines is exactly what we saw in, in another series. Exactly the same thing. It was like, how could that possibly be? So how do you keep that from happening, or do you? Because there's so much good TV coming on now, and so many 
innovative ideas, I'm sure there's got to be difficult it's really to hard. keep original. It's really hard because we have this executive at Fremantle who we went out to pitch with who said, he would always say before every pitch, now make sure it's different than like anything that anyone's ever yeah. heard before. Yeah. That, that, like, what, what are they the looking the for? Are They're looking about? for something original. Uh, like Great, nothing thanks. is truly original and like there have to be things that you've seen before so you can connect to it too. So, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> How yeah, do you it, do that? It, it, it's, it's impossible to not sort of be speaking to, for the culture. Look, there, look, Joseph Campbell says there are only a few stories in yeah. all of human humanity, and we tell the same stories over and over in different versions. So it's. But I think the why now, like you were talking about earlier, like why do you have to tell this story now that can save you from that? Because our, our show is not just an FBI show, it's about something that's we feel is very relevant and are passionate about now. So I think that helps. Yeah, it's tough. It's just part of being an artist and sometimes you have to sh turn down the noise. Oh, I mean, the yeah, every idea I present, somebody says, oh, well, Netflix just bought something sort of just like, horrible, like yeah. turn you, it down, turn it down, just turn down the noise. You can't write to trends either because by the time you, you, people are always like, you know, make the next Killing Eve and it's like, well, okay, but by the time we make the next Killing Eve, that sh like there will be a new hot show. You're chasing a trend, you're too late. Yeah, the train's left the station, you're chasing it. That means you're too late. You yeah. need to be in front of the train. So don't think too much about trends. Actually, I to, if I might just say, if people are aspiring writers, what people are looking for is an original voice. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean That's it's true. not a cop show or FBI show or a lawyer show. There are all those sorts of things. But you know, if, I, if I'm reading scripts, it, which I don't, but if I have to uh, for work, it's the first. It's really the first five pages. And is there somebody there who's like, I, I don't care. If, I might have no interest in this show this movie, but like, wow, okay, that was an interesting scene. They did something I hadn't read before. They did something kind of crazy and fun and weird and a little unexpected. Hmm. I Hi. Thank <laughs> you so much. Just love hearing about this, even though I've uh, talked to you both before, of course, but um, it's so enlightening. So how is it when you've worked and reworked and reworked a pitch and you've put so much into it, like The Believers, and I think you said seven months or whatever it is working on it, from the plot, the story, the characters, and then you present it and they want you to, as you mentioned, completely change one of the characters. Isn't that incredibly difficult? Do you ever fight to try to keep at least part of that character? How does that work? Uh, Not with FX, because <laughs> it's FX. Like they, yeah. when they bought the pitch, it's interesting because there are these, you know, there's premise pilots and non-premise pilots and premise pilots are like, um, well, uh, in our, Breaking ours, Bad. And, we pitched and a premise pilot we where pitched, the informant meets, the a agent meets the informant and it's like, oh my God, that's, the, that's the start what of I need. I'm going to get her on my side. I'm going I'm to get her to work for me. And FX said, no, we want them to already be working with each other. So that changes the entire story. But they didn't just say that. They actually, FX has a brand. You know, they all have yeah. brands. And actually, they, their job, if it's HBO or whatever, is to know what works for their audience. And so they're sitting there, sitting there saying, FX called and said, hey, Ron, uh, I have a relationship with the executives. They called and they said, we, we, we want to do your show, but we have, you know, one thing. You know, we don't do, we don't do premise pilots. We don't start, everything, we'll, we'll, our characters know each other. Things, you know, you're they're in the, the middle, middle not at the beginning. No beginning. And that, you know, like if you're precious, it's like, oh, no, I'm so attached to that. You're not going to get anywhere. You know, it's like, yeah, that's great. Let's jump in. And that's a challenge to a writer. The whole thing about what we do, you know, and I sound very dismissive. But look, I love poetry. I love great writing. I really admire people who do that sort of thing where they sit. And it's all about their expressing themselves, although I, whatever. But it's not what I do. You know, I have to be, I have to be able to turn on. In the pitch, people would throw out something. And, you'd, I, you'd say, and if you could say, oh, no, we're not going to do that. Are they going to buy your pitch? You go like, you know what? That's kind of interesting. But I have learned, I think Ananya has just said intuitively, to know, you know, a really bad idea is you, you can't do it. Uh, you know, so there's a point at which you might in some situations say to somebody, it's like, you know, that, you know, in doing it, you might get a note. And you sometimes are obliged to say, I actually think that's not going to work, but I, I could try something like this. Yeah. It always has to be a positive. It's almost as soon as you're saying, I'm not going to do that, you know, unless you're Ryan Murphy, 
who can do anything at this point, uh, or Shonda Rhimes, you know, you, you're not going to get very far. It's kind of like the improve or replace thing in the writer's room. It applies with executives. Like, yeah. if they give you a note, maybe you can kind of improve on it or kind of try to replace it with something else. But you, what you can't do is be like, no. Or at least I would never work, that's for sure. I'm just thinking, like, no, but right. some kind of a consequence. Right. Yeah. But yeah. there's a clarity to somebody saying, we want, this, we want them to know each other. And there's something very exciting to me as a writer of not explaining, not explaining. Like, how did they become an FBI agent? Who gives a shit? You know, like, <laughs> Neil Cross says, you know, like, they ask him, Neil Cross, who created Luther, did you watch Luther with Idris Elba? It's like, amazing. So Neil Cross, they ask, somebody said to, like, Somebody asked Neil like once, like, why does Luther like have to like, why is he so obsessed with solving this crime? And Neil said, he's a cop. <laughs> like, that's what they do, you know? So, yeah. another. This is wonderful, both of you. Oh, Thank you so you. much. Hi. Hello. It's so funny, you can't quite see until now I, I see. <laughs> well, this is delightful. Would you like to expound on the uh, how directors work with showrunners for television? Hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> so, on my feature films, except with some exceptions, like Christy and I, Christy is the production designer for many, many films, including Philadelphia. Oh. And that's where we met. Wow. Oh. Jonathan introduced us and we were like blah, 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 blah. We were like totally agreeing and disagreeing with him over something and he said, oh, I see you two are getting along really well. Um, <laughs> and it's been that way. It's been a love story ever since. And um, so, except for Philadelphia, where as you know, I was there all the time and just right at Jonathan's side. You know, if you're lucky, if you write a feature, maybe you're invited to the set, but God forbid you say to the director, you know, that's not really what I want to end off the set. Uh, for the most part, for the most part. Um, on TV, the way it works is that I'm the producer writer. And as Alex Ganza said, when I went out to my episodes on Homeland, he said, Ron, you're the boss. It's your show. And so you stand next to the director. Directors here in the room going to get mad. Uh, you, but this is the truth. If you're a television director, you know this. You stand next to the director as the writer-producer. with the, And what, you know, the director will say, cut. And you watch the take. And you're both watching the monitor. And the, and the director is ready to move on. The director will say, I think we've got it. The director turns to the writer-producer and says, do we have it? And the writer-producer says, I, I actually, I think you need another take. He didn't do the, that thing. And, he's, and the director will say, oh, yeah, right. OK, I'll try that. That's, that's the difference. That's why I love television. Yeah. And I have to say is I wanted to be a director. So now that I'm a TV writer, I feel like I never have to direct again. <laughs> because I get to be on set, and I get to be with these wonderful actors and, and have feedback and input. And I, it, it's just the most fulfilling thing, because you're not just like pushed away. <laughs> but it's a great collaboration. And I, the, I think yeah. the directors I've worked with, are, were, we had a, such a great time. And you know the directors will say, I have sometimes say, hey, Ron, you know the thing in the middle of the scene? Does, that, well, just, does Carrie really need those three lines? And yeah. you go like, no. no. <laughs> but great, thank you. Yeah, you know, so it's a, it's a collaboration. you know. And there are rules on the set, though. I cannot go. I'm not supposed to. There, actually, it's by the DGA says I'm not allowed. I could be fined. The show could be fined if, for example, I went up to the actors and gave them acting notes. The, the show would, the DGA, if the director complained, then the show would have to pay. And it's a big fine actually. Hmm. So, uh, and that's the rule. You know, I, I respect what the director is there to do. Now, when Carrie on Homeland, and I'm, you know, my third year is an EP on it, and I'm talking, Claire Danes is in her seventh year of acting in it, the director is sometimes catching up to us. So a lot of times the director will say, why don't you go talk to Claire about that? You know, or, or let's go talk together. To, but you always have to be respectful to the director, because they, they, they're, they're there for a reason, because they, they work with actors. That's their job. That's what they're trained to do. Hi, Ron. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm so deep into Ray right now. I'm, I'm oh. a late comer. I'm in season four. And I stopped. I, I, I was only there for two seasons, and I haven't, that I, I haven't I'm aware of loyalty. I haven't watched since. But. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, um, 
I watch it because I like the ensemble a lot. I think the, the work that the actors do is tremendously honest. Um, when I see a single writer come up after an episode, um, is it fair to assume that that writer is part of the writer's room and not an outside writer that's getting a, a brief... Uh, you mean when you see the credit episode? come up? Yeah, I'll see a single credit come up um, um, right after the director credit. Yeah, no, they, they wrote the episode. Yeah, they worked the episode. Yes. Yeah. So are they working in the writer's room? Some rooms work differently. I, you know, some rooms, I, some rooms, the writers are not necessarily in the room all the time. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's sometimes if you want to write Deborah Khan that we worked with in season seven and season eight, she, because of her family, she was from New York and her family situation and the other mm -hmm. obligations she was doing didn't allow her to be in the room as often. But, you know, she, but so, yeah, but I, uh, but often, you know, the showrunner might have had a, a lot, a, a, you know, Alex really helped with uh, you know, episode, season, episode six, for example. Alex wrote a significant part of it. He re rewrote us significantly in, in uh, on many scenes in that because it was just really something that was really, it was very Jean Le Carre, which is, he's really in his head and he really knew how to do. And Alex does not take credit. So if he can, you know, that's, He's such a gracious showrunner, and for the most part, you're not supposed to take credit as a showrunner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, although some people have bigger egos than others, and they will. Um, but anyway, so that but no, that's who that's who wrote the episode, and they may or may not be in the room. And Is most there? showrunners do a significant amount of rewriting. That's kind of their job to make it sound like mm -hmm. one voice, which is why yeah. when you watch TV shows, you're like, how could so many people? It's because the showrunner went and put their thing on the end, oh, that's like great. that. Uh, so how many days before shooting? Uh, is it expected for the cast to have sides? <laughs> Kathy? Uh, <laughs> did you get, si you got sides on the morning, didn't you? Did you get a script in advance? I, 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 I did, you know, I've been on a, a, a number of different shows and that's always the theory, you know, that you have to sometimes, yeah. sometimes, um, sometimes they'll give you pages in the morning, which is um, amazing. And sometimes they'll give you you know, your pages, your script 10 days in advance. And it, it, it really depends. And sometimes they, they'll change things in the moment. And, oh, yeah. it, it, you know, um, the, I worked with the Duffer Brothers, who I also thought in this listening to you guys w was very interesting because they do, they do some improv because they're working with kids, right? Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so it, they... It's a different, like everybody's different. And ev when you get a script is different, what, what you're required to do with that script is different. Um, it, the, it's, it's a movable feast. So I don't know there's any one rule. Yeah, there's not, yeah. It, it, I, I have to say one of the joys though of being on, and Homeland was very much the cast, for the most part, did the script. You know, Claire and Mandy, having long-term history, would have early conversations with the showrunners early in the season to talk about where their characters are going and have very valid and significant input to it. And, you know, but on the set, for the most part, we because those, those scenes were so hammered out of research. I mean, I spoke on one episode about uh, se my season five, I, think, I can't even remember now, se was about uh, the Iran nuclear deal, they were trying to subvert it, or oh, maybe it was season, season six. Season six. Yeah, it was. And um, they, I, um, I actually was able to call Ambassador Beth Jones, who had negotiated the Iran <laughs> nuclear deal, because yeah. it was Homeland. And everybody yeah. in, in Washington loves Homeland. And you know, I call him like, Ambassador Jones, she's like, call me Beth. And like, oh, I want to do this like crazy thing. Like, how would they get the money? Like, gold bullion? Like, they want to like pay the North Koreans to subvert, secretly do like a nuclear program and all this kind of stuff. She goes, Ron. And this is like, she's fairly important person. I'd imagine doing important things. <laughs> and she's like, I'm gonna talk to my colleagues. This is a great idea. I'll get back to you in about an hour. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. <laughs> so, you know, when that, when a scene has been, you know, in the writer's room, has gone through that intense research, has gone through other writer's room, and then gone through the network, giving their notes and all that kind of stuff, to be, it can't be rethought on the set because, A, Showtime will call and say, uh, didn't we give you a note about that? Uh, you know, so, but what does happen on, you know, what was thrilling was for me as the writer to listen and for Claire and Mandy especially who had their long history to service and you know, say, do I need this? Do I need this? Can I do this? Can I move this here? And it was great. 
And you know, my you know, especially to Claire and Mandy, usually was like yes. Although sometimes I do remember once explaining to Claire some somewhat ridiculous thing that she was going to do for like you know the tenth time in the history of Homeland, and uh, and she, was, I, was, I was trying to like make it like where you're like overselling to an actor, like I'm trying to really make it make sense to you, Claire. And it's like, but see, it makes sense because you know it's blah 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 blah. And I could see like her eyes glazing over. And she said, Ron, it's okay, it's Homeland. Which means like I do crazy things do all the yeah. time. Yeah, just, 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 just shoot this like and forget the explanation. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. This was so informative. Um, so if you don't have a showrunner contact and you have an idea for a show, and you do do the preparation, like the slides, and you script it out, um, what is something that we can do as people who don't have uh, contacts with showrunners or who don't move up the ladder like Anya did with getting an assistant job and then into the writer's room? Like, is there a way, should we like submit our pitch to a TV festival, or is there like, people like yourself who do take meetings with people that to go over their ideas? I don't take people, I can't take meetings with people who aren't represented, but um, it's, it's a legal thing and my studio wouldn't let me. Uh, I, this is what I suggest. If you, the Writers Guild is all about this. There are all kinds of, just go to the Writers Guild, they have all kinds of ways to, to sort of help bring pink, they love, especially now, because they're in this big conflict with the, the, net, the studios, yeah. and with agents, so they, they love recruiting people to eventually have careers so they can have more members, and I, you know, and so, I, I would go to the Writers Guild. I would go to film festivals. I would say I, I'm not really interested. I'm what would interest me if I was open to it would be reading people's writing. I like I don't need no offense. I I'm people like I'm not walking around like empty. Like gee, I wonder what I could write a show about. I have like years of things I have yet to. Uh, to, to wrestle with, and I have very specific things that I want to wrestle with, so it, to me it's not an open question. So, um, I, but there are, but for you to find the people who are interested in the same thing you're interested in, I, I, I always suggest to people to go to the Writers Guild, don't you? Yeah, and you know, some of these competitions, I, I submitted to a bunch of them when I was breaking in with a feature, but there's like the Austin Film Festival screenplay, which some of you guys placed really well in, my students, if I may. <laughs> um, and just other like festivals and like Writers Guild, like there are people who, that is a good way, I think, to meet the right people and also finding a mentor, somebody who has more experience than you to help you kind of usher. But it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship. I always get frustrated when people think that you can just take something from someone. Like I could just call Ron and be like, can you help me? No, I had to be like, I'm gonna help you. What do you need? What can I do for you to help you? And then so it became that I, kind I of think thing. The ultimate point is that you, you really have to be in the world. It's really hard, it, and be in the world, as Anya did. And Anya said, I'm gonna be fetching coffee for people for maybe five years. And she was in the world. So there was that moment when the creator of Homeland said, I think Anya, she's probably pretty smart and talented. And I said, Alex, here you go. And then that door opened. It, when you're outside, people who are in the world, it, it's a, it's, it, you know, I, I have, every assistant who worked on Homeland writes to me once a month. You know, and I have, these are people that I love and really got to know and care about. And they say, Ron, you know, if you have any opportunities, so you know, I have a long list of young people in my life uh, that are I am looking to help and move forward. So, in some ways, my my catalogs, my my it's already closed in a way, if you know what I mean. And no offense, and those people are in my world. And Anya found her her way into the world of television, being outside the world and just sending stuff. You just have to make the work. relationships, and I also have to say just about your own work that. Because while I was fetching coffee, I was getting up at five in the morning every morning to make my script better and to write. And I would write weekends and I write nights and I didn't go out anywhere and I had rice and beans for dinner <laughs> for three years, you know? Um, you, because when you do get the opportunity and the door does open and someone like Ron says, hey, can I read your, I will read your script. You know, and I never asked him. After I never years. said, read my script. After several years, <laughs> I'll read your script. I'm then sorry. I have that work that's kind of, it, it has to be undeniable. It has to have that 
level because then you cannot go back to that person and say, hey, that first draft really sucked, but I rewrote it three times. You can't do that. It just has to be at the professional level. So it's kind of both. Yeah, and I know it's, it's a hard thing to say, but it's actually, it's a hard business. I, I, it is a business, ultimately, and I know it feels hard and cold to say that, but, it, but there are film festivals, and Anya got attention first with a great 20-minute short film. From so this festival. Th and that yeah. gets you into a festival, and then you're, con then you're run. And a, a great short film can take you to festivals all over the world where you're constantly in the company of other filmmakers. So find some way to get into the world somehow. Festivals are a way of doing it, but you gotta have something. I, th I actually think a pitch is hard to like convince people to pay attention to because the la uh, you know, like, I, I, I think I would rather actually shoot myself than, you know, at the point, because it's just like, I live in pitches, I like uh, my spare time, I don't wanna hear somebody's pitch, like it's my whole life. And any executive is gonna be saying to themselves, I, I just heard somebody of Showtime saying, I was, we were, I was in an elevator with her and she says, I have to hear fucking eight pitches tomorrow. Yeah, it's a lot. She says, I could kill myself. Yeah. <laughs> but the short film could be really good too. And, you know, and, like, and, they, and, they, and you walk in, these people, they listen. They actually really sit there and they listen and it's exhausting. Can you imagine hearing eight pitches like a day yeah. for like that's your job? So it's a really hard thing to ask. And I think, but to have something, like Anya had a calling card, which was that short film and a 15 or 20 minute compelling short film is a really, e that's not as hard to ask. That's like, because also you're not saying, turn this into something. Mm. You're saying, here you go, there's something I made. And I already had the feature yeah. script written. So, based on so, the so when someone hands me something that they want me to do something with, it's like, uh, you know what, I work so hard. I, I really just like wanna like, like hang out with my goddaughter, you know, I, you know what I mean? So my spare time is not open. To, uh, to business, outside my business, you know? But a great short film that played in a few festivals and won a couple prizes, that's kind of interesting, you know? That interests me. Well, so, um, uh, At what stage um, is the director chosen for the episode? You know, because like we're used to with movies and plays, you know, the director being, you know, the big yeah. enchilada. And then, you know, I see a series like Homeland or something else where there's you know, a different director for each episode. Yeah. And when you're writing an episode, you know who's going to direct it. And I'm assuming uh, the showrunner chooses, but at what point do they wait till they, you know, what point does the director get selected? Well, uh, a show that's been on for a while, like Homeland, which is that it's part of the A-list premium shows, that's a small circle of directors that are doing those shows, and then they go to Ray Donovan, and then they go, you know, they go around to the, those premium cable shows. And Homeland, they have like their company, they've been directing for Homeland for years. So they come on to it. There are two roles for a director. They can be hired per episode, but sometimes they come on as a directing EP. So on our show, Leslie Linka Gladder uh, is the directing EP. She does four episodes a year, and she's there all season. And she mm. guides the other directors. And she say on Homeland, you know, and especially if there's someone has never been on the show before, Leslie sort of shows them the ropes. Mm. Sometimes I it feels like it. they come on very fast. Like I'm always just so amazed by how quickly they get our script. Like just, they read it the that's night before do. and then they're like explaining the script to me and I'm like, do you know it better than I? <laughs> like it's yeah, amazing. It's what they do. Yeah. How, how often on set do actors actually have any kind of participation in the collaboration of the script? And is there a difference between whether it's a TV show or whether it's a feature film? So for instance, um, I got a call on a lacrosse field to um, be in the movie The Power of Few with Christopher Walken. And my um, lawyer says, do you want to read the script first? I said, it's Christopher Walken, I'll do it. He goes, you need to be on a plane. On the way down, I'm reading the script for the first time going, holy shit. So I get to the set and I, and I was actually able to say to them, if you want me to do that as a CIA operative who's torturing Navid Negabam, you might not get a rating on your show. And they actually listened to me as we kind of reconstructed the yeah. scene. How often does that happen? I, I would just say that... It uh, was an indie. Uh, you see, if somebody showed up on Homeland, for example, once who had, she was, had two scenes in the episode, and we started reading with Claire Danes, and the person who was a day player basically said, you know, I was thinking maybe I could, and Claire stopped her and said, on Homeland we do the script. Hmm. Right. Uh, so if you're Claire Danes and you're at the center of the show, you know, I, sir, to come up like Kathy, I, I, you didn't feel like you were, I, if you have a question and sort of say, might this, but I have to say, it's so, we have 12 hours today, 
to do an amazing amount of work. And if you're slowing me down because you're asking all these questions because you thought you were rewriting my work on the way here, guess what? We're going to shoot your part tomorrow with somebody else. I'm sorry. It's right, that right. just true. Like, you, Well, I just said if you do it that way, you're not going to get a writing, a, a rating. And if you see the power few with Christopher Walken, you'll see what I'm talking about. That you know, I am the torturer they bring in, and I and I said, how about do it the way that uh, Hitchcock used yeah. to do? It. Take you right up to it, and then show you the action. Yeah, I, yeah. And look, everyone. Yeah, it, yeah. That's a, that's a different yeah situation than yeah, yeah. It's, it's a different thing. But uh, one more. What about the, I don't know if you want to say temperature, but what's going on with TV writing in New York City? Does it seem to be taking off anymore? Or do you really oh need to God. be in LA? No, it's not. It's not. No, not. no. I, uh, TV writing in oh, New TV York. Writing. I mean, there are a couple more. rooms in New York. Um, I know they did, um, what was that f amazing show, Fosse Verdon on FX. I know the room was in New York because it's a very New York based shows. But most shows that are shot in New York are not written in New York. They're written in LA. <laughs> okay, we should wrap it up. That, should we wrap it up like wrap it up? We should wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you.